Hi everybody, Dr. Mike here. In this video, I wanna to talk to you about what happens to the spinal cord after injury. Now, you can divide spinal cord injury up into what's happening in the primary injury and the secondary injury. Simply put, the primary injury is the direct mechanical trauma that's occurring at the spinal cord. And usually, it's some form of impact with persistent compression. What I'm referring to here is the fact that the spinal cord is surrounded by the vertebral column, which are bones. And those bones can fracture and break and fragments of those bones can impact the spinal cord directly. This is mechanical trauma. And you can see I've shown some mechanical trauma or damage to the spinal cord here. Now in the primary injury what you're going to find is that there's disruption of axons. So remember you've got a neuron, a neuron has the body of the neuron, the axon and that just sends the electrical signal and then the end of the neuron. So you've got damage of these axons which means no signals being sent. And you've also got damage to the cell membranes. So remember the cells within the spinal cord, they're neurons and glia, supporting cells. Cells that surround the neurons that provide it nutrients and make sure its environment's okay. Disruption of the cell membrane simply means that this membrane that surrounds it is broken and all the components inside the cell leaks out. This is what's happening in the primary injury phase. Now, the secondary injury phase is what's happening minutes to months and sometimes years after the initial spinal cord injury. And it's characterized by a whole cascade of events. These events include vascular damage, iron imbalances, electro, uh, excitotoxicity, free radical formation, inflammation, scar formation. I'm gonna talk about all of these. So the first thing I wanna talk about is the initial spinal cord injury, the primary injury. You've got direct damage, potentially from bone fragments, but you also have vascular damage. The blood vessels are affected. Now, there's three large arteries that feed the spinal cord. They're rarely affected in this case, but what you're gonna find is the branches of these blood vessels, they're the ones that are affected. These branches go into the spinal cord and they feed oxygen and nutrients to the cells of the spinal cord, so the neurons and glia. They're usually what's affected. Now, when they're affected, they're broken, they're damaged, and what happens is all the fluid of the blood leaks out into the spinal cord. What happens in this case? Well, if the fluid leaks out, it increases the pressure in the spinal cord. Now, increasing the pressure is further going to exacerbate mechanical injury. Pushing pressure on the spinal cord is direct injury, so that exacerbates it. But what about the cells that usually get fed by these broken blood vessels? They're no longer getting fed, so that means these cells no longer get oxygen and they no longer get nutrients. Now, if they don't get oxygen and nutrients, it means the cells no longer make energy. And without energy, many of the processes of the cells stop. But think about this, if blood is leaking out, right, you've got around about five to six liters of blood inside of your body. If that blood leaks out, your blood pressure drops. So while the pressure at the spinal cord increases, your overall blood pressure diminishes. And this results in something called shock. Shock is where your body doesn't get fed the oxygen and nutrients. So your body responds. How does your body respond when it goes into shock? It needs to try and bump blood pressure up. And the way it does it is activating that fight or flight system, sympathetic nervous system. It tells all the intact blood vessels to constrict. Now the problem here is, it's gonna tell blood vessels of the spinal cord that are intact to constrict. And that further limits oxygen and nutrients and further causes cells not to produce any energy. So what's gonna be the outcome of cells not producing any energy? Well. Cell death, basically, the cells are gonna die, but how does this process occur? So firstly, when a neuron wants to send a signal, all that's basically happening is that there is sodium that sits outside the cell. Now this sodium needs to jump into the neuron. And it actually does this in a domino-like fashion, just jumps into the neuron like this. And you can see, if sodium jumps in, it's moving its way down the neuron, down the axon. This is that electrical signal that your neuron sent to tell your muscles to move and for you to be able to feel. And what it results in is a whole bunch of sodium inside the cell. But you can't send another signal because the sodium's trapped in the cell. You need to get that sodium out. How do we get sodium out of the cell? Well, luckily we have pumps in all the cells of our body, including our neurons. And what these pumps do is they take the sodium and they throw it back out. And they do it by swapping sodium with potassium and throwing potassium in. However, the important point here is to do this, we need energy. Now the cells aren't producing any energy anymore because they're not getting any oxygen and nutrients. No energy means this process isn't happening. And 
sodium starts to accumulate inside of the neurons. We don't want this. We don't want sodium accumulating in the neurons. We need to find a way to get it out. Luckily, there's another pump that our cells can use. This pump swaps sodium that's inside the cell, swaps it for calcium that's sitting outside the cell. Good old calcium swaps it, throws all this calcium inside the cell. But the problem here is we start to accumulate huge amounts of calcium inside the cell. And here's an important point. Calcium influx, which you can see I've written here, calcium influx is a signal to tell cells to die. So what happens here is the cell begins to die because of all this calcium influx. If a cell dies, its membranes are disrupted and all of its components that are inside start to leak out. They're not supposed to be leaking out. Some of these components, because they're neurons, are neurotransmitters. And one really important neurotransmitter is glutamate. Really important. What does glutamate do? Glutamate is released from one neuron, I'll write it as G here, and it binds to a receptor on another neuron, and what it does is it tells that neuron to send a signal. It's excitatory, right? How does it tell it to send a signal? It tells it by throwing sodium inside the cell and by throwing small amounts of calcium inside the cell. Anything that has a positive charge it tries to throw inside because it's the positive charge that sends that signal. But if you've got huge amounts of calcium, you throw in huge amounts of sodium, huge amounts, uh, huge amounts of glutamate, you throw in huge amounts of sodium, huge amounts of calcium, and more cells die. What you see is this cascading effect of cell death. Now, what does the body do to try and stop this? Luckily, our body has something called autophagy. Auto means self, phagy or phage means to eat. What this autophagy does is it goes along, it finds cells that are damaged, it encapsulates it, and it digests it and recycles it so that all these components don't leak out. It's a protective mechanism. So what research is doing at the moment, interestingly, is trying to boost autophagy. And in animal models, it's shown to be beneficial for spinal cord repair and regeneration. But what other research is shown to do is think about it. If one of the problems here is throwing that sodium out and throwing that calcium in, why don't we just block that channel? And we do. There is research showing that sodium calcium channel blockers have shown to be beneficial for spinal cord repair and regeneration in animal models. What else could we do? Well, we've shown that this excitotoxicity of glutamate, too much glutamate being released, binding to the cell, causes more death. So why don't we just block the receptor? And we do, and that's some research as well shown to be beneficial for spinal cord repair and regeneration. The other thing that's happening in this process is inflammation. Now inflammation occurs anytime there's damage to tissue that has a blood supply. So that's happening here. Now inflammation is good, and bad. Inflammation, I always say, is like a friend that's come over to visit. In the short term, great. In the long term, you get sick and tired of it. That's inflammation. What inflammation does is it, re uh, it cleans and repairs. That's what it does. Cleans and repairs, which sounds great, but the problem is it's a non-specific response that the body has. It's non-specific. So it doesn't know that this is the spinal cord that it's doing. It could be the skin, for example. So what it does is it promotes autophagy, it promotes cell death, and wipes everything away and rebuilds. But what it rebuilds is not more neurons. It's not more glia. It's like breaking a house down and rebuilding a wall. But in this case, it's rebuilding a wall on a highway and it's blocking the highway. And that's what's happening. And this is a scar formation. Now this scar that's being formed, we call a glial scar. And the reason why it's called a glial scar is because glial cells, like astrocytes and microglia, are promoting this inflammatory response to form the scar. And it's not as simple as just stopping these things because we need this cleaning and repairing to happen. Because remember, blood vessels are damaged, for example. Now if a blood vessel is damaged, the barrier between the blood supply and the spinal cord has gone. So anything that's in the blood can now go into the spinal cord and damage it. So we need to repair this blood spinal cord barrier. So this process of activating astrocytes and microglia to clean and repair is actually good in some ways, but detrimental in others. So what we're trying to do with our spinal cord research is trying to identify ways to promote the cleaning, but inhibiting that scar formation. And this is a quick summary of what's happening in primary injury and secondary injury of spinal cord damage.